All right, we have attendees joining us now, so we're going to give them another moment before we begin. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Christopher Ryan, admissions advisor at Stony Brook University. Today, we are here for uh, one of our faculty workshop series events. We are joined by uh, Professor Andrew Flesher. He's a professor of family population and preventative medicine and professor of English at Stony Brook University. So just a couple housekeeping items. We're going to ask you to submit your questions via the Q&A here. And if there are any admissions questions, we'll answer those on the fly. Anything pertaining directly to this series, um, we'll, we'll propose to Andrew. So uh, the floor is yours. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, maybe we could get the uh, share screen function going. And Thank you. So just to introduce myself a little bit more, um, I do a lot at Stony Brook. Uh, I teach medical students, I teach PhD and master students, and my favorite population of students to teach are undergraduates. Uh, I do both bioethics and medical humanities, and I also do public health, which is big in the news right now. And today, uh, by way of introducing you um, to what life might be like if we're lucky enough to have you and you're lucky enough to come, I'm gonna to try to make sort of three implicit running arguments. Uh, and you can press me on this in the question and answer. The first is that uh, if you come to Stony Brook University, which is what's known as a research one university, um, you're gonna get faculty that are both um, um, ensconced in primary research. They are current in their fields and they are producing in their fields and people who love teaching. Um, and as part of your learning experience, you very likely will have opportunities to integrate, to have your faculty integrate your learning experience um, with what they're working on. So that's an exciting thing that doesn't necessarily happen at every university. I'm gonna give you uh, maybe an example of that or two. Uh, the second thing I hope to argue, and this isn't sort of implicit in my title, is that it's a special place in insofar as the health sciences need the humanities and the humanities need the health sciences that uh, it's a kind of place where those two worlds um, have a symbiotic relationship and an ever-growing interdisciplinary symbiotic uh, relationship. And I hope in the next hour, um, you're gonna get an example through just mere exposure to me, but I'm one among many, I'm nothing special, uh, a sense of what kind of professor you're likely to encounter if you come here, uh, which is to say, um, in exposing you to the kind of thinking that I'm doing and the kind of thinking that this presentation will represent, you'll get a sense of what I think uh, many of my colleagues would show you where they to be in front of you. I'm not an exception to the rule. I pretty much fall right in there. Um, so uh, very much looking forward to sharing some of what I do with you. I'm gonna give you three kinds of examples today. One is uh, a grant that I'm working on. Um, and I'm involving students in thinking about that grant. The second is uh, an article that I'm, is now in press and I'm planning on publishing. And the third is a course that I taught last spring and will again be teaching this spring, all three of which uh, are instances of, of putting the humanities together with the uh, health sciences. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So this is uh, sort of an indication of the kind of um, isms with which I identify myself, medical humanities, medical ethics, bioethics, public health. And this kind of phrase is of my own making. Um, as a bioethicist, you know, our first order of business is always to think about uh, creative ways and compassionate ways to provide comfort for the afflicted. But not too long after that, uh, the business becomes applying a good measure of affliction for the comfortable. What do I mean by that? Um, I mean that these are questions uh, that I ask and that we as scholars ask where you could be intelligent and have a different view of the matter, that there's a body of literature, but intelligent people can interpret that literature and then come to a different kind of normative conclusion. So these are not no brainer issues. Um, they're issues with which to roll up your sleeves um, and warning they can be addictive. Uh, you see some images here, uh, you might imagine that things have gotten quite interesting um, in the context of our current plague. And as you'll see in a little bit, 
uh, just before uh, COVID-19 hit, I was already in the midst of teaching my medicine, religion, and ethics course to undergraduates uh, in, in the literature to a very um, large degree already focused on death and dying and plague and triage literature. So this, of course, uh, made things more interesting. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> In, in medical ethics, we tend to look at a few ubiquitous issues. That's, of course, a reference there to uh, Rodin's The Thinker uh, below. But one of the questions is, how do you allocate scarce resources? Early on when COVID-19 hit, huge question on which medical ethicists were weighing, and we were thinking about this um, in our hospital as well. Who gets the vent under what circumstances? How do you make those life-death decisions? When it comes to these kinds of medical ethics decisions, you're, you don't always have a best case scenario. At best, you're choosing between relatively tragic options. There is not going to be the outcome that you ideally would have wanted. So under circumstances of triage, where we have to come up with a, an algorithm for determining how to allocate resources in emergency, how do we do so fairly? How do we do so equitably? How do we do so in view of a future when the disturbed normal that has just become the new normal is yet to return to the old normal, right? How do we get through on that bridge? And as I said earlier, um, quite addictively, these are non no brainer issues. So if you're interested in a major that is a so-called STEM major, um, health sciences, medicine, engineering, other sciences, um, one of the things that the humanities does is give you the capacity for critical thought and perspective taking by virtue of which you can come to the situation with a humane and informed opinion. Um, okay, next slide, please. And, you know, this was basically a, a, a graphic image early on of what I just discussed. Um, very sadly, this is happening every, in every state in the United States. Um, Many, many hospitals are now 100% full to capacity. Uh, I just read an op-ed that said that people um, who would have lived had they presented with the same conditions two months ago are now dying because they're simply um, healthcare settings that are overwhelmed. Uh, at Stony Brook, we are doing a wonderful job dealing with every sing single person as they come in, um, paying attention to their idiosyncratic situation. Um, we still have the luxury of, of, of competent leadership and, and um, uh, staff to help out with this, but you know, these are always informed by human values, these decisions. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the first of the three examples I said I would uh, share with you. This is a grant that I'm working on with my colleagues that's going to involve our graduate students, um, we're still working out how to uh, fund a postdoc for this. But basically, this is the idea that in an era of social distancing where we know that mitigation efforts such as mask wearing, staying six feet from each other, and so on and so forth, uh, you're all familiar with the guidelines here, uh, save lives, that that's a tangible outcome. And you know, prior to an era where vaccines are, have been taken and, and have been widely distributed, these are um, clearly best practices. Maybe what we aren't looking at um, with quite the same level of um, intensity are the costs of social distancing. And I'm not simply thinking of the obvious, right? Not the, just the mere economic shutdown costs, but how about mental health? How about domestic violence? How about um, violence towards children? How about other kinds of conditions that aren't getting treated because hospitals are full? So. These, of course, are policy decisions that are informed by our moral and religious traditions. Um, they require an interdisciplinary, in, interdisciplinary approach to get right. It's not simply um, a quick and easy calculation, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you some bullet, bullet points about what this grant will hopefully address, um, and I come from a program in public health, public health itself signals an endeavor to figure out how to promote health uh, protective measures across populations of disparate individuals. So we're thinking about a whole population, right? There are always individual needs and preferences, um, but despite that, we are by definition all in it together. Um, we don't get to choose whether or not our lives are gonna be affected by a virus uh, that was precipitated in conditions in a completely other part of the world, right? Even outside the era of COVID-19, um, our health and well-being depends on other people vaccinating their children, 
other people smoking or not in public spaces, other people owning firearms or not, uh, diet even. How do we weigh individual liberties against freedoms in the public good? This is a question that um, has animated my career um, from the beginning. So another way of putting this in terms of policy is where should government nudge paternalistically and where does oversight go too far? Should we have a mandate? Should we have strong incentives? Should we have uh, unrestrained, undiluted policies of freedom and liberty, right? Uh, another quick question um, that's not so quick in the era of COVID-19, for how long do we keep the economy shut down for the sake of keeping us maximally safe, right? Again, this is not an either or, timing is involved and many, many factors need to be considered. We know that we can't have a zero COVID workplace, right? We're not, we can't have the luxury of being perfectionists. So how much risk, this is a huge question in public health, are we willing to tolerate at what cost of mental health, economic stability and relationships um, in a population of individuals about which I'm particularly concerned, especially since uh, I'm a new father and would very much like to introduce uh, our daughter to her grandparents is how do we deal with the elderly? Uh, do we isolate them for their own good? Um, well, that seems kind of cruel in a way, right? It's, it's a population that's on the one hand vulnerable, but on the other hand, arguably the least equipped to deal psychologically uh, with distancing. So this is a, a critical question that is gonna require values uh, to address. And finally, to what extent do and should we take into account some of the stakeholders uh, in populations that I mentioned earlier, uh, such as the poor, the disabled, the homeless, the incarcerated, victims of domestic abuse, all of these different um, groups of individuals that are gonna be uh, affected by larger kinds of policy decisions. Very, very interesting stuff and requires an interdisciplinary approach that as I said earlier, combines the humanities and the health sciences. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just sort of a, a teaser of, of um, my own personal way of addressing these matters. I'm in an English department. I love teaching courses in the English department. Um, I think fiction is a wonderful way through indirect communication of putting yourself front and center in the situation. So um, a lot of these books that I read with my students take the perspective of a physician who then becomes the patient. Um, Oryx and Crake is about a post-apocalyptic world um, in which in the process of removing all threats and disease, we've actually removed the human race too. Um, other kinds of literature about death and dying. Uh, so this becomes not only um, a mechanism for dealing with real world uh, instances, you know, th that no one has the luxury of being spared. No one gets through this world unscathed. It also has uh, the virtue of, of exploring these things with some classic and contemporary classic literature. Um, and I'm of the view that reading is good for the soul. So in all of these endeavors, I try on either side of my life, uh, whether it's the health sciences or, or the humanities to bring both together. Next slide, please. And this is just uh, another example. This is an article I've just written. Uh, the title of it was called The Virtue of Mortality, uh, Considering Bioethical Responses to CRISPR. I'll explain what that is in just a moment in more detail, but it's basically what kinds of new problems do the advancing frontiers of technology introduce to us for the first time? Wonderful movie, if you haven't seen it, it's a little bit older now, uh, called Gattaca starring Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman. Uh, in this film, there are quote unquote degenerates. It's a great term of art. Those who are not uh, uh, privy to the best gene therapy as a result of which they get discriminated against and, and this film raises all sorts of other uh, kinds of ethical issues. And you see the cartoon there on the upper right. Um, next slide, please. And just briefly, uh, you should know this, it's becoming part of our uh, parlance, at least in the heart, uh, health sciences. CRISPR uh, specifically refers to clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And what it is is a bacterial defense system underlying new genome editing capabilities in which genes in living cells and organisms can be permanently altered. Okay, so this is germline editing, correcting for mutations, potentially eliminating defects in whole species over time. So in short, it's a technology whereby we can change our species as genes are inherited uh, over generations. This is cutting edge science fiction stuff. And it, it, it warrants uh, reflection and probing um, 
you know, consideration of what this brave new world is that's uh, Aldo Huxley's term that we're inheriting. Next slide, please. So there's several kinds of distinct uh, ethical issues that could be raised with CRISPR. I'm working on the fifth of these, which is um, a, a very humanities approach. But first of all, of course, uh, for anybody that's worked in a lab or that has uh, worked uh, with human subjects, are there safety concerns with CRISPR and other kinds of genetic editing technology? There still are no universal precautionary measures. There's not even transparency uh, as a result of which uh, there's lack of fairness in the scientific community. And this leads to an undue kind of competitiveness um, and also to unintended side consequences. Uh, Michael Crichton made a career of exploring these, the late Michael Crichton in his wonderful novels. Um, perfect exemplification of which is Jurassic Park, which is an even better book than it is a movie. Um, I urge you to read it if you haven't. Another kind of ethical concern is commodification, which technically is the process whereby markets reduce different ways of valuing things to tangible dimensions, namely money, um, which leads to the debasement of a good. Um, all of a sudden that which used to have a sacred valence has, is now pedestrian. And this um, leads to all sorts of religious and other kinds of values-based objections. I've already referred to the third kind of ethical issue here, which is discrimination against the poor. How about these new genetic technologies where those of privilege have access, but those don't? Um, and by the way, you've already probably read an article or two about the parts of the world that are gonna have to wait till 2022 to get the COVID vaccine. Um, we already know this because there are disparities in health that those with means are healthier because they have access to health better. Um, a more chilling kind of ethical outcome is this idea of eugenics. Uh, it was prohibited in Article 13 of the Oviedo Convention of 1997. Um, we are not allowed, according to this inter international convention, to engage in kinds of technologies that will lead to a super race. That is an indirect form of genocide. And then finally, the question that I address directly, um, maybe the most subtle question of the five, in the paper to which I just referred, is that even if we perfectly answer the objections that emerge in one through four, um, right, no side consequences, safe approaches, we through regulation address discrimination. What if everything goes right? Is this the world that we're going to want, right? There's still a kind of chilling outcome if everything goes right. And I'll tell you what I mean by this. Next slide, please. And this is a very fun slide to just ponder. Uh, just take a look at, at this and, and try to absorb this. What if we could do all these things in a way that we did them safely, that no one was discriminated against, that there were no super races, that is to say everyone had access, there, there wasn't any kind of discrimination. Is this the world we'd want? Another way of asking this question, and this is an age old humanities kind of religious studies question, right? It's a, it's a question of theodicy. Um, how much suffering in the world makes the world a better place, right? That seems like an odd way of putting things. Would we want to be immortal? Or if we were immortal, would we die of boredom? Um, could, would we want to be able to parent children uh, as, as old as we could? Uh, Mick Jagger <laughs> was 73, you see in a parenthetical allusion uh, in the second to bottom foot, no, the bullet point there. When he was 73, he fathered his eighth child. Is that something we really want to be able to do? Do we want to be able to be infinitely smart? Um, do we want to be able to be infinitely strong? There's a reason that world records at the Olympics when they're broken are broken by very few um, microseconds or uh, pounds or ounces, right? That makes them special. What is it to be a human being? These are, these are fundamental questions of human nature. Yet there's some things on this list like dealing with terrible diseases such as Huntington's disease and Tay-Sachs disease, which are um, monogenomic kinds of diseases, which is to say they can be addressed by just fixing that one flaw uh, on the genome, right? That you would have a much stronger case for wanting to address. Are there any principles that can help us to decide what is kosher in terms of describing that thing as medical therapy and what is unkosher in terms of describing that in terms of mere aesthetic enhancement? And should there be that line or is that an arbitrary line? Uh, I, I warned you that this was kind of addictive stuff. So uh, I'm not gonna take the time due to constraints of time to read all of these, but, but each one of them you could spend a full class on. 
And if you take a class with, with me, indeed you will. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. And then finally, uh, I've just introduced to you a grant that I've worked on and a paper that I've written in, 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 as a result of conversations I've had with my students. Now I just wanna introduce you to a course uh, that I taught last spring for the first time and I'm teaching again this spring. It'll have much more of a COVID-19 feel this spring um, on literature, medicine and ethics. Uh, currently that's under the title of English 370, but there's gonna be a new underclass version of this for, for freshmen and uh, sophomores. And these are just the books um, that are you know, relatively inexpensive. Most are fiction, a couple are sort of diary accounts of physicians slash patients, but all of them probe our humanity. What is it to be a human being? Are we our most selves uh, when we are human? By the way, that picture on the left comes from Boccaccio's The Decameron, uh, which is not listed as a book I have for purchase, but I give excerpts of this. This is a band of individuals who during the bubonic plague in the outskirts of Florence sort of fled and coped in solidarity uh, by telling stories. And that image on the right is of Memorial Hospital in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, um, when only very few physicians and clinicians stayed uh, under the crisis of rising floodwaters and unbearable heat. And how do you deal with a population of individuals where it's simply uh, impossible, logistically and resource-wise impossible to save everyone? How do you put people into categories where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck in terms of saving? These are not necessarily pleasant questions to ask, but they become more palatable when we bring uh, to bear the idea of humane virtues that can help us uh, shine some light on the situation. Next slide, please. And this is just a little taste of the description. My, my syllabi are very involved, but this is, I wanted to give you um, the actual uh, you know, words that I used, I'm gonna be revising this in the spring, when I taught this course uh, last uh, year in spring of 2021. Uh, this is a quote from the syllabus, when we are sick, we are our most vulnerable and arguably most ourselves. That's a controversial statement. And one of the implicit claims of this class, which is also controversial, is that compassionate care is not a redundant phrase that there are forms of non-compassionate care. And that furthermore, there's a difference between a disease, which is an objective pathogenic condition, and an illness, I-L-L-N-E-S-S, -S, that's like how I like to think of the word, um, which is subjective, right? It's a subjective distress, coping with which the, the one who falls sick is basically dealing with that person's uh, relationship to his or her every everything. When you're sick, your entire world is now in jeopardy. It's not just a thing that's wrong with your body, uh, which if you go into the body mechanic, um, you drive out and you're fine. It's a much, much bigger deal. It's existential, right? It's philosophical. What are the best ways of thinking about our relation to those who are struggling? Um, so this was a, a fun class because it doesn't just bring up that kind of humane question, but genuine moral dilemma is what I called earlier, non-no-brainer issues um, that could be answered, excuse me, in different ways uh, by different, you know, people in the class. So we have a, it's a very discussion-based kind of experience. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, I, you know, just to, to let you know what, what my sense is uh, about some of the virtues uh, related to the medical humanities as a discipline. Um, what is the added value of taking a humanities-based approach to STEM? It allows us to take the perspective of people who are not ourselves and not, you know, in our own um, familiar uh, walks of life. It involves critical thought, right? Not taking things for granted, but actually thinking them through and thinking about objection to them. And as I said earlier, uh, it renders a compassionate form of care uh, where you think about the other person in need first, instead of reducing everything to your own um, framework. And its content, right, is both, and this is a phrase by uh, Francis Peabody, who is a um, seminal thinker in, in medicine and in the practice of medicine in this country from Harvard. There's both a science and art at all times to treating people who are in need. Uh, next slide, please. And I just finally wanted to uh, end 
um, with some, you know, icons that represent my own personal identities uh, around campus, um, School of Medicine, uh, Public Health, Department of English. I'm so fortunate and proud uh, to be part of all of this. Um, one of my hopes is that more and more and more these worlds will come to overlap uh, as well I think they should in the 21st century. Um, but I deliberately made this somewhat on the short side so that I could do the best uh, possible job answering your questions. I had a full half hour, uh, but I've, I've done it quicker than that because I, I want every single one of your questions to be answered if that's possible. So um, that's all for the formal presentation. Uh, maybe we can now go to questions. And happy to have you moderate that, uh, Chris. Yes, thank you, Andrew. It was a very illuminating presentation and we do have some questions. Uh, okay. Some of them were chatted to me privately, so you may not be able to see them. Okay, no problem. First up, we have, how can I prepare in high school if I'm interested in studying medical humanities? Um, I'm gonna give an off the cuff answer here. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a real simple one syllable word, <laughs> verb, read. <laughs> Do a lot of reading. And um, maybe you could share in the chat, uh, Chris or, or Theon, my, my email address. It would be so delighted if you're, if, if you're serious to give you a reading list. Um, if you want, I'll even give you my best movies to watch during the pandemic, best TV shows uh, you never knew you could live without. Um, all sorts of lists that I have for a pandemic, but I will certainly give you the list of must read books that, um, teasingly and very engagingly introduce some of these cutting edge technology issues, but from a way that you take the perspective of the human character with whom you can identify. Um, I am convinced if you just curl up um, with your favorite tea or coffee or drink uh, and read uh, that this will be all the training you need for when you get to college. And um, I'm glad that you, uh, so I see, a, a, I would like a reading list if you don't mind. Uh, just for purposes of, of economy, if, if, if you could get the email from, from Christopher at the end, and I will uh, happily give you some, some, some books to read. But um, the other thing I want to say, because I didn't say it earlier, is if, if you are thinking about a career in the health sciences, and there are so many ways to go here, or, or any sort of STEM career, computer programmer, physician, um, healthcare administrator of a uh, person's you know, uh, uh, retirement community. I mean, I, my mind is flooding with possible um, uh, careers that you could have. I, I really believe this. There is no better thing in which you could be an undergraduate major in than English, than the Department of English. Why is that so? Because as pre-med or pre-anything, you will be told by our excellent advising here what courses you need to take for your professional ambitions later on. But college is your only time, even at a research college, right? Even one with pragmatic aims, such as the one that we have. It's the time for you to luxuriate for four years and think about what your relation is in the world. The best possible antidote to burnout is that you will be equipped to know why you're doing what you're doing when you're working very hard doing it. And that is to know yourself as a human being alongside other human beings that you're serving. Now, the wrinkle here that to me makes it even more exciting is that being a human being is complicated. It's not, you know, we're not automatons. We don't follow an algorithm to live in. People are different, they come from different places, and even people that come from the same place had different ways of reasoning, right? That's what makes dinner conversations uh, interesting. That what, that's what makes friendships the best sorts of friendships is a diversity of perspective. And that's what makes classes interesting. And to the extent that I have taught or been exposed watching my colleagues teach, which is always thrilling for me, I always see different ideas presented where there is plenty of room to have a collaborative but diverse conversation about which way to go, right? Whether to take a left or a right or stay put for a bit, uh, to be a little bit metaphorical about that. Which is to say, if you have a STEM ambition but you major in something in the humanities, you're gonna get the best of both worlds. And we know what we're doing here. We're not gonna let you get lost. Uh, you will be still equipped to follow the path that will get you to your goal. Um, but you'll, 
you know, I've had some exposure to um, medical school admissions and one of my best friends at Stony Brook is the medical school advisor. Uh, and I am pretty confident that he would say the same thing, that you would not only not be hurting yourself, but helping yourself uh, by exposing yourself to both while you're in college. Based on everything you're saying, I really want to get an invitation to one of your dinner parties. They said <laughs> <laughs> um, after after the after the plague. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so, in a similar vein, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit again. So, uh, the students are asking about your reading list. Um, if you could provide off the cuff, uh, do you have any other movie recommendations besides? Oh, that? sure. No, I, I love this question. Um, well, Gattaca for sure. Um, I, you know, kind of cheesy, but it's accessible. It's on Amazon right now. Uh, the Boys, I, I don't think it's a great show, but it's season one is certainly legitimate um, about superheroes that are made to be superheroes and what goes wrong there. Um, there's, there's all sorts of films about that, looking at the chilling utopia about when we advance the frontiers of technology, is this the world that we want? A couple that deal with artificial intelligence. I would only recommend, I'm, I'm kind of a snob, but I would only recommend season one of Westworld, which, which you can get on DVD now, but it's an HBO show. Uh, a great science fiction film um, where you basically get all of Westworld, but in two hours is a movie called Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I have a whole list. I, I, I'm being flooded with, with, uh, with, with thoughts about how to answer this. Um, one of the, I'm sorry to go classic here. I know there's a film based on it as well, but I would actually read it. Maybe you already have in high school, but one of the best things you could read is Homer's Odyssey because in the Odyssey, you've got this character of Calypso, who's a goddess that offers Odysseus a life of immortality with a beautiful woman. And he turns it down and to maybe die on the ocean. Uh, the, uh, Poseidon is really upset with Odysseus when this happens in the text because Odysseus has just killed his son, the Cyclops, Polymethus. And, you know, Odysseus says, no, I will travel back to my wife, Penelope, who is also aging. Um, he's gonna have a few storms because Poseidon's gonna exact his revenge. So the question arises, why would Odysseus choose a painful mortality involving struggle in an aging wife over um, a goddess on a paradise island, right? So there's lots of these questions that explore, if you could have this uh, option, would you? I have to mention in this um, a wonderful Black Mirror episode from season three. Please write this down. This is the one that won the Emmy and this is only an hour of your life. San Junipero, San Junipero from season three of Black Mirror. I love every one of these episodes, but this might be my favorite. Uh, and in this episode, I don't want to tell you what it's about because it will ruin the episode. It's sort of one of those things that are brilliantly told to you on a need to know basis. But you're dealing with questions about if we could extend our lives in the most happy way imaginable, would we? Um, there's another movie that explores this question, both in Spanish, um, Abre los Ojos, and then in English starring Tom Cruise, Vanilla Sky. Uh, and that is uh, a wonderful film to ask the same question, if we could, would we? And I just see in the comments of uh, the movie Her, uh, starring Joaquin Phoenix, another superb example of this. Uh, I have a whole list. Again, if you email me, I'll give it to you. Uh, but I'm a big believer in the best kinds of fiction and the best kinds of smart TV, um, opening up vistas for exploration. Uh, I see a question about admissions uh, so maybe um, that question should be fielded uh, by one of you. Yeah, uh, Ramis, if you have a question uh, for admissions, please, you know, feel type it in the chat. Uh, just to keep things uh, in, you know, the momentum that we have, we do have another question that I'll propose to Andrew in the meantime. Um, how would I go about doing cross-curriculum studies, uh, whether you have some general advice or specifically about Stony Brook? Okay, so that's a broad question, and I defer to the excellent advisors in, that we have, uh, of, of which there are no shortage. Um, but here's my philosophy. My philosophy is these are the four years to do exactly what you want to do. Do not constrain your major based on some sort of professional ambition, okay? 
don't forego your professional ambition, keep your professional ambition. If you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a surgeon, if you want to be a computer programmer, uh, oh, by the way, on computer programming, you have to see Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, it's one of the best shows, unheralded gems of all time. If any of you out there are future computer programmers or engineers, Halt and Catch Fire, for sure. Four seasons of sheer gold. Um, but, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. If you want to you know, have a profession in X, but have an interdisciplinary experience, make sure your first semester here that you are picky and aggressive about getting to take exactly the classes you want, especially um, anything that is still occurring in the era of Zoom and remote learning. I know as a professor, I don't care how full the course is. If I hear from a student, I don't have the prerequisites, but trust me, I'm motivated, I'm eager. I will bend over backwards to make sure that that student is in my class. I don't care how big it is. I need the fire marshal to tell me uh, that the room is too small, okay? And my sense is most of my colleagues are that way too. We are in an era, this is good news for some of us, but maybe bad news for others of us. We are in an era in which um, every, every department at the university is getting pressure to be more things to more people. You know, there's a bad kind of corporate aspect to that, but there's a really good opportunistic thing as well, which is that, um, you know, we all have to feel the burden and we should feel the burden of making ourselves relevant to everyone else, which is to say you have the luxury of majoring in exactly what you want to. Now, the minute you graduate with your Stony Brook degree, that's all gone for the rest of your life. <laughs> I know people would disagree with me, but the amount of things by which you will be nickeled and dined to death and that time will slip through your fingers like sand would stun a team of oxen in its tracks. This is all you get. This is about you, four years uh, to learn about the world and to come into any profession humanely. So I wanna beg you, not just urge you, but beg you to be selfish about it and not selfish in a self-interested way, right? I don't mean self-absorbed and non-listening. I mean, these are the times, of, this is the time you're like, these are the four years or you know, more or less of your life to focus on yourself so that once you graduate, you can focus on others and you're gonna to have to, um, whether or not you become parents, as coworkers to somebody, you're gonna to have to have largesse and you're gonna to have to have exposure to different walks of life. So major in what you want to, if it's even faintly interesting to you, open that door, okay? In a word, again, one word answer to your question, experiment. Don't be rigid, don't feel like you have to do something. If something looks good, tiptoe into that pool. And if the water feels good, stay in the pool. You will still be able to get to uh, your career. And I swear to you, I'm going to make a bold promise right now. You can use my words and contact me once you come to Stony Brook. And if you feel as though you want to take X class, but your major constrains you in this following way, I will become your personal advocate and reach out to whomever to make that appeal uh, on your behalf of someone who showed up today and listened to me say that. I absolutely love that. Um, as you know, just from my own experiences, I started out as a biochemistry major in my undergrad for about two years, and I fell in love with uh, English and the creative writing program. And you know, after that, a couple classes, uh, I decided to stay in that warm water. And you know, the transferable skills and everything that comes with English and other fields are so applicable to you know career opportunities afterwards as well. Um, Another question that we have in the chat, can I do research as an English major? I mean, research is a broad term, but, but, but not just as an English major. I don't think there's a department at the university where there wouldn't be opportunities uh, for you to A, do scholarship beyond an undergraduate level, but B, if you uh, show the kind of right proactive interest, work with a professor on a publication. The best way to do that is the following. This, this is sort of my litmus test for my students. Um, Take a course with me early on, prove yourself to me in that course. And then I couldn't in good faith as an educator in the world, not strain myself to look for opportunities to work with you once you've done that. Uh, so the answer is yes, there's plenty of opportunities uh, as an English major or as another major. I, I don't think there's, a, there's a, a department at the university where you wouldn't have that opportunity. And Ramis asks, uh, 
as an aspiring surgeon, how can I learn more about medical ethics to educate myself in preparation for the field? <laughs> I mean, there, there's, you know, a hundred books and a thousand articles I could share with you. Um, but the best thing to do is, is come. And when you're here, either contact me or a number of other of my colleagues, and we could give you courses um, that you could take. The course that I just described um, is in a lot of ways, it's not straightforward medical ethics. You're not dealing with um, strict principles in this course of beneficence and non-maleficence and justice, but all of those things come up tangentially. And, you know, what is ethics anyway? Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those um, amorphous words for which there's no common core definition, um, but, you know, you know it when you're involved in it. What it is, is basically figuring out how to pursue the good. And people have different opinions on what that entails. So it's reading a received body of literature by authorities who have brought you to that point in time when you're first exposed to whatever question it is at hand. And then it's constructively bringing together these various sources to make an argument about a certain path down which you can travel so that suffering somewhere in the world is alleviated, whether that's physical suffering, um, which can be very painful, or psychological suffering, uh, or to, to use a better word, psychological sorrow. Uh, you know, ethics is our way of pursuing the good or alleviating the suffering of others. So this is a long-winded way of saying that even as a surgeon who one day will be judged um, on your, you know, technical skills and proficiency, uh, you will be walking into a situation where you're going to have family meetings um, with, you know, people under trying circumstances where there will be a risk assessment that needs to be undertaken, where you're going to need to communicate potential bad news. The kinds of literature that you'd read with me or any number of my colleagues that I can think of will be the exact same thing that running a track is, or running a lap around a track is to the future um, competitor um, in a high stakes track meet. Um, if you come to Stony Brook in particular, uh, there will be plenty of opportunities. And I just want to close that with my answer to that question by saying two more things. This is not true everywhere. It's, it, I do think it's true everywhere at Stony Brook, but it's not true everywhere. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, Tr Stony Brook has a superb uh, trauma one level hospital with state of the art everything. Um, I think we have 5 million vials of the Pfizer vaccine being stored right now. Don't, don't hold me to that number, but it's a an, it's an huge number. That doesn't happen nonchalantly just anywhere. And second of all, Stony Brook is a research one institution, but it's a research one institution where, and I can tell you this because as a full professor, I had to go through the APT process and teaching really mattered. Without a minimal number of points in teaching, I would not have gotten that promotion and credential. So, you have to be a good teacher here. And thirdly, we are encouraged in all sorts of ways, uh, subtle and explicit, to combine our teaching with our scholarship. That is to say, to be ruthlessly opportunistic about bringing uh, students to our research, um, either directly where they'd have their name on a publication or indirectly where they'd show up in the pages uh, of what we published um, and, and be involved in such a way that they'd then be poised in a letter that we'll write for them for a PhD program. Many, many, many of my students have gone on to pursue a PhD, way more than I would have thought. That's because I was in a position at Stony Brook to be able to deliver that. I have also taught 10 years of my career uh, where I was before Stony Brook at a teaching institution. Now, I adore that institution. I really do. I miss my colleagues there, and it's a good place. But neither of the things I mentioned that Stony Brook has going for it um, would be the case at that teaching institution. Thank you, Andrew. I have another question in the chat. Uh, this one comes from Brandon, and he wanted your opinion on the quote, and I, I don't recall the direct quote, but how the, uh, the world should be eradicated from genetic conditions. Um, do you think chronic diseases should be considered in that quote? So that, that's not exactly the quote. The question, the, the, the question I was raising is, where is the threshold that determines in germline editing what things we permanently get rid of? Uh, it's a great question. Was it Brandon that, that yeah. asked that question? So Brandon, I think diseases like Huntington's disease, for example, um, or a great example is Tay-Sachs disease, which is a, a dreadful lung disease that afflicts the young, um, where the 
those afflicted need transplantations you know, very early on in their life, um, are great candidates for how this kind of technology can make um, a massive difference, um, kind of the way the polio vaccine cured polio, right? There, it seems to be non-controversial. But then there are other kinds of conditions. Um, like, I'm just throwing this out there, it was on my list as well. How about deafness or blindness? Now, I'm not really in a position to answer that question. I'm not deaf or blind. I think I would want to consult people from the deaf and blind communities to see how they felt about losing an important part of their identity if future generations of deaf or blind people wouldn't exist. One that might be in the middle where you're kind of dealing with controversy on both ends is autism. Would we get rid of autism if we could? Um, on the one hand, I can imagine people who have a loved one who has autism saying, anybody who says no offensively is not in a position to answer that question. And I can imagine other people saying, anybody who says yes is offensively not in a position to answer that question unless they have direct experience with it. This is the virtue of the humanities in debating these things. What does constitute the threshold? And I'm gonna give you a fascinating example, Brandon, of something I just learned in my research that made its way into my article. Um, uh, maybe you could do a poll, Chris, because this is a, kind of an interesting question. Do we, uh, I'll give you a hint. Human beings are number two, okay? Number three is a distant third to human beings, but human beings are a distant second to the number one killer, the living organism that represents the number one killer. Does anybody want to give an example or give, give the answer to what the number one killer is in the chat? What's the, what's the, the organism in the world that's the number one killer, the living organism? This is a great question. We need a few brave souls to kick off the uh, chat with this. And it's very important to what I'm about to say next. It's okay if nobody knows. I mean, it's my least favorite living being that has ever existed. Uh, viruses, we won't count viruses, but viruses have to do with the answer. The bacteria is still too small. <laughs> There we go, Edward got it, mosquitoes. Yes, that's the answer, right? And why are mosquitoes the deadliest thing that have ever roamed the earth, in a word? Their persistence? Yep, Edward, Edward got it again, malaria. malaria. Well, it is possible and research is being done, and Dana got it as well, nice job. There is research being done, could there be applications of CRISPR to get rid of malaria? Well, guess what? I'm sorry, I misspoke. To get rid of sickle cell anemia <laughs> is what I meant to say. Well, sickle cell anemia tends to occur in a specific part of the world, right? Specifically sub-Saharan Africa. Guess what? And I can send you the articles if you email me. There's all sorts of research to suggest that the condition of sickle cell uh, anemia, which we don't have time to go into right now, but which is a very painful condition and can even be life-threatening, protects you massively against malaria. It's not a coincidence, in other, or in other words, that these two diseases occur in the same part of the world. That's evolution. <laughs> and when you go messing with things that seem benign at the moment, over time, they may turn out not to be so benign. This is the very raison d'etre, at least one of them, of bioethics. Um, I'm not making this up. This is not speculative. Malaria and sickle cell anemia are related in this intimate way. So it would seem to be, to the lesser observer, of course you'd want to get rid of sickle cell anemia. What might that do though in the long term in terms of malaria? What, what, what happens when we save trees and the forests grow too much, right? There's all sorts of iterations of this question and they all fall, fall under the rubric of ethics. So great question and I hope uh, that, that answers, Brandon, and nice participation, nice class participation. Giving us a lot to think about here uh, <laughs> as, as we close in on, on the end of this session. We have another question uh, from Tasnia. I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, looking to be a cardiologist, are there opportunities at Stony Brook to, uh, I guess, some things more co-curricular or in the field um, other than the classes, uh, such as interning at hospitals or volunteering? Absolutely. 
And, and this is not a Stony Brook thing. The, the, the best way to become involved is to show up. People, whoever they are, are human beings. And human beings <laughs> are very impressed with eager individuals who represent themselves as people who want to be involved. Um, I, I know a lot of cardiologists, so but but I, I'm not, you know, off the cuff in a moment to speak to what specific opportunities they have. But in general, I know lots of cases of undergraduates working with uh, esteemed and very busy faculty. If there's an opportunity to do this anywhere, it's at Stony Brook. That that's unfortunately the most specific I can get, unless it becomes my own field. I happen to work um, in the area of organ donation. I'm a living donor advocate at Stony Brook, which means I'm one of the two people as a living donor advocate that certifies that someone who is poised to donate their kidney to give, give, to give the gift of life is consenting and hasn't been coerced in any way. I've just begun a program where my students, and in this case, it's my master's of public health students, um, are now the first points of contact between those prospective donors before they even get a medical test to see if they're the right blood type. So my students are doing something that couldn't be less clerical and more substantive um, it, with, with the stakes higher. They're interviewing potential donors of a kidney, even potential donors to strangers, to see and make sure they haven't been paid, that there's nothing that's incentivizing them, that's untoward. Um, so, and Christopher just provided the link to the webpage for Hall's Hospital Volunteerism. Uh, I play piano in a hospital lobby uh, for patients and staff. Um, you know, that's part of that volunteer program. Yes, there are abundant, abundance of opportunities. Uh, so in, in a similar vein, I guess maybe if we want to tack on just a couple more things, we have two more questions that we'll answer in this session. Uh, community-based initiatives is pretty broad, um, but if you can list a few that maybe you've been involved in or, or people you know. Well, I just mentioned one. Um, I'm also part of a, a community-based initiative where I go around to libraries and lecture. Um, but I mean, my mind is flooding with opportunities uh, just in the program of public health uh, in which I'm a part. Um, there are opportunities translating um, critical materials during the pandemic uh, to the public. That's led by my colleague, Hector Alcala. Uh, my colleague, Amy Hammock, deals with um, domestic violence um, and, and sexual abuse and violence. Um, and she spearheads a whole bunch of uh, community effort, uh, efforts as well as um, is a leader in our um, community-based track for the um, public health uh, program. Um, I have a colleague involved in the, you know, toxins in the environment. Uh, I, I could just go down the list, even within my own small world in public health, and list a whole bunch of opportunities. Um, plentiful. I just am not going to have the time to do that right now. Um, by the way, I apologize for the hoarseness of my voice. Uh, my newborn had me awake all night, so <laughs> I'm a little strained there. Congratulations, yeah. Andrew. Um, all right, so this is the question that we're going to end on, and you know, we, we've heard a lot about you and, and the things that you're involved in, you know, from the community-based perspectives and you know the academe. Uh, so while we have the Renaissance man in, in the hot seat right now, uh, with so many opportunities, it can be a little intimidating and wonderful to pick something that you want to do for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. How did you realize what you wanted to pursue? Oh, I, I, the, do, this is a do not try this at home answer, but it is the truth, and I try to try to tell the truth. This is very important in my opinion. Do not do something you don't wanna do, okay? So start with a massive process of elimination. Have no one push you into anything. Sometimes, um, and this is true in the case of me, you're not gonna know what your calling is. So you just have to throw a dart at a dartboard and see where it lands and see where it takes you. Make sure it's not something you don't wanna do, but sometimes the faintest inkling of what you do wanna do can open up vistas. Um, this wasn't mentioned yet, but I got my PhD in comparative religious ethics. Uh, that was at Brown University. I got my undergraduate degree at Duke. I majored in medieval Renaissance studies, medieval history, and medieval music. Uh, this was all me being uh, non-compromising about going through the doors I wanted to go through until the age of 22. Then I had a job I hated for two years uh, in corporate America. 
Um, but, and then I, 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 with all seriousness, basically plunged right in and it became my life. I really believe in that. And I especially believe in college in specific being your time to figure it all out. Do not put pressure on yourself. The mere interest in something is all the justification in the world that you need to check something out. And then it is not up to you, in my opinion, this is my view, it's up to me as your professor to see if, to, to give you every opportunity to be further interested in that thing. You don't wanna be um, individuals who prescriptively go through life. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't follow your dream. I'm a real big believer in those who do have a calling and following their dream. To those people, I would just say, supplement it with as much other stuff as you can while you still can. You won't be able to do it that much afterwards. Life really comes at you fast. That is what college is for. From a prof professor's perspective, it's our last line of defense to make you <laughs> into robustly compassionate perspective taking human beings before you become professionals. From your perspective, it's your last line of defense to defend the self in you before it has to emerge and become, and your person becomes, you're still your person, but a whole bunch of different personas as well. Um, so th that, that, that's my personal answer. Other people have different answers, but I, it was framed as a bold question. So um, don't cheat yourself. Do exactly what you want to do. You have the every right um, and, and opportunity to do that until you get your Stony Brook degree. Okay, something a little bit lighter. I, something just came to me, a personal curiosity. What are you watching right now? Uh, you know, you look- Oh my God, I just told everyone that I'm a truth teller. Uh, and now I might be judged by my answer, but I have to say, uh, it's a guilty pleasure. It's not what I would call high art. I'll mention some examples of high art in a minute, but that wasn't the question. The question is, what am I watching right now? All right, Netflix, I just finished all five seasons of Narcos. Um, it was absolutely superb for this reason. As a viewer, you are put in that country. And I already speak Spanish pretty well, but this helped me really work on my Spanish. 90 something percent of the show is in Spanish, which I love. Uh, the acting is terrific, the writing is terrific, it's nuanced. It does, in my view, um, responsible justice to history. Um, but I wouldn't say it's the very, very best thing out there. Current, very, very best things out there. I mean, philosoph philosophically as high-minded as you can get. Uh, Fargo on FX, I think, is better. Um, I already mentioned Halt and Catch Fire. That's a Netflix show I finished. Uh, just eight episodes of, and I'm sure you've all heard of this, The Queen's Gambit. You can't buy a chessboard now in the United States because of that. Um, and the best show I've ever seen, I'll give you two. These are both HBO. Um, the best show I've ever seen in my life is The Wire. If you haven't seen all five seasons of The Wire, I'm jealous of you. You have 60 beautiful episodes waiting to unwrap. Do not double task while watching that show. Uh, it's too in involved. And then finally, season one of True Detective starring Matthew McConaughey mm. and Woody Harrelson. Um, if you really want to explore uh, the darkness even beyond the dark uh, and a couple people who are themselves rather flawed um, shepherding us through those hallways uh, to get us to some sort of version of sanity. It is just a brilliant, rich, um, humane show, uh, but, but, but violent to a certain extent. Um, and then also, I know I'm dating myself here, uh, but Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, Better Call Saul, uh, and Mad Men uh, as well. Um, if you want to see a fantasy, uh, this is on my top 10 list that has nothing to do with reality, all too sadly, uh, The West Wing. <laughs> that would be my prime time recommendation. But again, that's 20 years old. Incredible recommendations. I definitely join you. The Wire is an incredible show. It's one of my favorites as well. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us today, Andrew. Uh, we really appreciate your insight and, and your, your personality and everything you brought to the table with us today. And Tien dropped some additional information in the chat. So if we weren't able to get to you today, know that we do want to connect with you. We want to, you know, serve your interests and see if Stony Brook is the right place for you. So get in touch with us and this will be, this recording will be available uh, in probably a couple of days. So check for it on our YouTube channel. Everyone have a great night. Stay safe and stay warm. Thank you.